Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to the CSR International Convention Center. I'm VP Pretoria, Safety and Setup Coordinator of the Center. Before you proceed, I'm just going to give you a couple of health protocols as well as evacuation protocols of the center. Kindly make use of our hand sanitizer stations located within the foyer as well as the venue as frequently as possible. In the unlikely event of an emergency, an alarm will sound throughout the building. Trained responders will give instructions on the evacu evacuation. Stay calm. Take only belongings that you can carry. Walk in an orderly manner. Do not run. Responders will lead you to an emergency exit, then to the assembly point. Restrooms are available throughout the building. Kindly look out for the signage. As this is a public building, please do not leave your valuables unattended. Free wireless internet access is available throughout the building. Select free CSR ICC on your device. No password is required. For assistance, please call on any of our staff members who will contact the technician to provide support. Thank you and enjoy your session. Good day, esteemed guests, care partners. I am Vijay Naidu, the Clinical Product Specialist at Arjo, and I'm very elated to welcome every one of you. Um, it's indeed a pleasure. I think we're expecting 500 delegates, and so there's more to come. Um, my great honor is to welcome Catherine Steer. Um, Catherine have known for many years. Um, I consider her a titan within the prevention and management in the pressure injury uh, a portfolio. We've traveled over the years, and what I do appreciate besides her Canadian accent, which you're going to, it's quite intoxicating. Uh, Catherine is a um, clinical uh, presenter. She's been uh, within the industry and training in Africa, the Middle East, for the last or the past 25 years. Uh, welcome, Catherine Steele, uh, while I go through the remaining of um, today's program. We're later on going to be welcoming um, um, Phoebe Brewer. Phoebe will be going through the medical legal of BTE. Uh, today's session, uh, this morning's session as well as the afternoon, each session carries four CPD points. I would please ask that you do remain for both sessions, um, even though you're not using VTE or venous thromboembolism uh, products. It's a very clinical uh, session, however, it's going to be very educational and I welcome you to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to go through is the house rules besides the gentleman that went through it. Uh, if you could please put your phones on silent um, or switch off uh, for respect for our um, esteemed guests. As well as, uh, in terms of the ladies or the gents, um, I don't think I heard it clearly, but I'm going to navigate you to it. I think it brings in my, I always wanted to be a flight attendant and show you the directions in the plane. I'm going to do that now as well, where I'm going to say, if you need to use uh, the restrooms during the session, you would navigate yourself uh, to the back, and then it's on the extreme right hand side. Um, after this morning session, we are having a RG fair as well. Um, it's an open fair, there's no time to it, so you are welcome to join that as well, and there's going to be refreshments after the session. So we commence now until 11 o'clock, and then we're going to have a convenience break. We're calling it more an empowering movement uh, for 15 minutes uh, before we welcome our next speaker. If there's any questions you have or any comments, I do understand that there are microphones on your table. Um, even though we do have that, uh, we will be having about a 10 minute session for Q&A. Thank you so much and welcome if you've just joined us. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see a few familiar faces, actually. And I'm sure a few people have seen me throughout the years, um, coming down and doing various lectures on various topics. Um, I thank you very much for being here, first of all. It's a lot of effort to get out of work. Well, maybe not that much effort. <laughs> but it takes um, a lot of effort to basically want to continue to improve your knowledge on pressure injuries. One of the challenges that I've had with 
Arjo and other companies throughout the years is trying to make this topic um, sexy. <laughs> Again, <laughs> it's a difficult one um, to keep people interested in when, especially for the last few years, COVID has really um, sort of embraced and overcome us in many, many um, ways. So I'm going to be bringing in a lot of different areas to consider. Um, I really want, I guess my sort of goal from today is hopefully to impart a couple of pieces of extra information, um, update you on the research that has been done in pressure injuries throughout the world. But more importantly, that you need to think about the practice that you are currently in and how this can influence the practice and what you can take back to help others, um, specifically the patients. Okay. So I, I ask the question all the time, you know, is pressure injury preventable? Are we getting it right? And this is sort of a question to you. Are you getting it right in the areas, in the clinical areas that you work? Or do you feel that you're losing this battle? And if you are losing that battle, I hope I can give you a couple of pieces of information. If you are winning, then I'm actually thrilled for you because it is a tough battle to remember, especially when you're worried about you know, myocardial infarctions and, and you know, is your epinephrine up to a certain level and all those wonderful things that are going on in the ICU, CCUs, you know, medical wards, surgical wards, even the emergency departments. So let's see what we got. So why injury? Just out of curiosity, how many people are still calling these wounds, or the potential for these wounds, pressure ulcers. Just put up your hand. Okay, so we've, we've at least upgraded a little bit. So I don't know if you, you were back in my day. I think there are a few in this room that were back in my day. But when I started, it was decubitus. Everything was decubitus. It did not matter where it was in the body. It was decubitus, right? And then it was, amazingly enough, a bed sore, because it can only happen in a bed. Yeah, that's, we know that's not true. <laughs> okay, and now we're thankfully beyond pressure ulcer and we're up to the point of pressure injury. Why do we see this as an injury? This is actually a COVID patient. You probably recognize a few CPAP um, injuries and just oxygen, just general oxygen. These are injuries that occur due to pressure. And we call them an injury and we're beyond an ulcer because truly an ulcer is indicative of a wound that, or a potential for a wound that is greater than six to 10 weeks of age. Pressure ulcers can develop in less than 24 hours. Okay. So, and the cause of them, so you always have to think what is the cause? Okay, the cause is that the pressure was not relieved. It's a simple cause and effect. So if you are responsible, and I don't want to put all this medical legal on you, but if you are responsible for not relieving that pressure, okay, then you cause the injury. And that is a big medical legal in, these, in this day and age. And in the last 10, 12 years, it has become extremely, uh, worldwide, it's become a, a, an issue. So I want you to take that on, but not to point fingers at anybody or anything. I want just people to be aware of it. So not only have we changed it because an injury can occur in less than 24 hours, but also to the medical legal aspects of it, that it was a cause and effect. Okay, so we can have various types. We can have, I, I love the pictures because everybody says, ooh, but I'm, I'm sure you see these in your wards all the time. Well, hopefully you don't actually. <laughs> Okay, so we have various types. Okay, we've got the heel ulcers, which I'm actually gonna go into today, and we have lots of good old sacral ulcers. Okay. The next thing is why, sorry, it's not moving as quickly as I'd like it to. Do you know the incidence and prevalence of a hospital-acquired pressure injury in your clinical area or in your hospital? Do you actually know what percentage of patients that can come into your ward into your unit and sustain a pressure injury. If you don't, then I suggest you do. Because the only way of getting, especially if there's a lot of nurses in the room from 
or other allied health professionals in the room from the government sector, is unless you can prove that this is an issue, your funding is not going to be directed in that way to help you. And I'm talking about support, I'm talking about surface support, beds, I'm talking about mobility support, I'm talking about good wound care. There's nothing worse than going back to when I started wound care and having to do a pressure injury four times a day. QID. Wasn't that a lovely time? <laughs> Thankfully, we're now on about every three days, I'd like to think. But these are things that we need to look at. Because if you don't understand the insolence and prevalence, okay, then you actually... So prevalence is what's happened today or in the last 24 hours. Incidence is over a period of time. And generally, what the hospital admin wants to know is what is your percentage of hospital-acquired pressure injuries over a period of time? Then, in what area, what clinical area, so that they can start looking at how to decrease that risk? Okay? The other thing that you might be wanting to ask yourself is what is the current pra practice in your area of a risk assessment? Okay? Are there risk criteria in the area that you work? Risk criteria are things like a risk assessment, rats that they like to call them, um, or things like the, the Waterloo, the, um, the Braden, Norton, okay? I'm gonna go through it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a skeptic, um, but I'm gonna tell you why as I go through it. There has to be a well-researched and st statistically significant outcome when you're going to use an assessment criteria. And these have been well-researched and statistically significant in terms of their outcomes. But there's a point at which we use it as a check, check sheet so that the higher Bs can see we went chick, 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 and then there's nothing done about it. So intervention or treatment is not done. And I'm being very broad. People in this room might be really great at it. But generally, when we find an incidence of an increased risk of pressure injuries in an area, it's generally because you haven't done a risk assessment. So how do we take that risk assessment and make it tangible? How can we make it user-friendly? How can we use this? I'm hoping I'm gonna give you some guidelines today. Is in your risk assessment some sort of skin assessment. The skin needs to be assessed from top to bottom, literally bottom. Okay, you're gonna see a lot of bottoms today. <laughs> so we need to make sure we roll these patients. We look at their heels, okay? And then is there a surface assessment associated? So in your water, water law, in your Braden, in your Norton, whatever you're looking at, okay, is there an assessment of or of the, of the surface, but is there a, a grading to say, if the patient is at risk here, we need to implement a surface there, okay? These are things I want you to think about and make sure that they're actually in the assessment tools. So sort of going back to, sorry, lots of bums today, sorry about that. Um, I just want to kind of step back a bit. And obviously this is a well-ensued injury that has occurred over time. And a reminder that although many people think of pressure injuries as being chronic, they were born acute. They came from somewhere. Okay, whether it is just a purple spot to a red urothemic area to eventually a shearing effect onto a blister, et cetera, et cetera. They had to evolve from somewhere. When we see wounds like this, okay, this could be two days old. I think it's actually about five days old. Um, this is not an ulcer yet. An ulcer is defined as a wound that, has, that is six to eight to 10 weeks of age, and it has slowed down the healing process, and basically we have a, a plateau of healing, if not a de degradation almost every single day. So 
we need to take this into account. So the first thing I'm going to say to you is when a pressure injury comes in, again, a skin assessment is really necessary. You need to basically put in your notes, this is a community acquired, number one. So the risk and the responsibility and the pointing of fingers is not on you. Second of all, you need to start addressing the risk to the patient in terms of their morbidity. These are patients that are generally immune compromised. They are of multiple comorbidities. And on average, elderly, okay, infirmed of some sort. And the first thing we should always be thinking about from an acute perspective is how bad is this wound? What stage is this wound? Is it just a soft tissue infection where it's just invading the tissues? Okay, does it go deeper than that? Okay, into a cellulitic, into the blood system, and basically septicemic, affecting the blood and different organs. So when I first came to this country, I think people will laugh at this, but um, I went around and looked at a lot of wounds from acute burns, trauma, to chronic pressure injuries. And in this country, it just seemed sepsis seemed to be the common word. Oh no, that's septic, that's septic, that's septic, that's septic. And I just went, wow, you've got a lot of sick patients in this country <laughs> that are all gonna die like tomorrow. Okay, I think we really need, when we're looking at wound care again, is to define, and I know there's a lot of wound care sisters probably even in this room, define the very slight differences between a local soft tissue infection to a, a basically a deeper depth, so we call it a deep tissue infection, into a cellulitis and potentially into a bacteremia, into a septicemia. Okay, and the way where we, where we should be starting is always evaluating the patient for SIRS, okay, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Okay, and if you can as simply do a good SIRS assessment, you'll probably have a very good understanding where this patient sits. On top of a few blood, blood values that I'm gonna be talking about later. Number one, please do not ignore the fact that these wounds, as extensive as this one is, okay, or as, as minor as a blister, needs to have a wound swab if you are in question of an infection. This has to be done. There are numerous times the patients are sent to me and a wound swab has not been taken, but the patient, amazingly enough, has been put on numerous antibiotics over the last several weeks, two months with not one wound swab taken. It is a basic. How you take a wound swab is you do not go into all that great old mucky necrosis. You do it from edge to edge, side to side, get a very good representation for you to take some of that necrosis, that slough, and send it off. That is histology, not semi-quantitative bacteria. Just a reminder, in, some, in case some people haven't done them in a while. Semi-quantitative is fine. Um, I'm not really going to start getting into fungal anything with you today, but semi-quantitative is fine. Okay. Let's go on to, oh yeah. So then basically we want to make sure that the big part of this is making sure that in order to get a comprehensive and an appropriate semi-quantitative swab, you need to have the patient off antibiotics for 48 hours. And I see that all the time. So I tell them to take a, take a swab, well of course they're now rushing to take a swab and the patient's been on numerous antibiotics, so I'm now swabbing nothing. <laughs> okay, so the patient has to be off antibiotics for at least 48 hours, okay, and a semi-quantitative swab is still fine, and if you're questioning anything further than that, then you'd have to take a tissue biopsy, okay? And that generally is not done by nurses. It will have to be done by a clinician. Okay, let's go into osteomyelitis. Remember, I'm just scraping the surface, okay? And the rest of the presentation is pretty much going to be about risk. There was a Gary Sibold 
another Canadian, and you, many of you in this room may have actually read many of his papers on wound care. Um, he is a gerontologist with a specialty in, in, in wounds. Um, quite well known um, throughout the world. And he said, if you can touch bone with a swab, you assume osteomyelitis until proven otherwise. Okay? So if you can touch bone, I mean, I don't even need to touch bone, I can see it. You can assume osteomyelitis. Okay? The golden rule on osteomyelitis, though, antibiotic free for 48 hours. Okay? Histology and multiple samples of the bony in infringement, if you want to call it that. Basically, a lot of clinicians want to rely on your x-ray and your CT. And x-ray and CT have a high specificity, okay, but a very low sensitivity. So they're not going to help you much, is basically what we're saying. Okay? Your histology or bone tissue biopsy is going to help you the most. Number one, prove it, and number one, tell you what what, what bacteria is, is, is insulting the area, and number two, tell you the sensitivity, which is important, okay? MRI is a high sensitivity and a low specificity. So an MRI is actually the one generally that we, that we go towards. But if in doubt, an X-ray first. I think a CT is a waste of time, okay? And then finally, Let's, from an acute perspective, well, not cute in a, in a sense that this wound is an acute wound, but if we look at the medullins. So maybe, maybe many of you are not familiar with the medullins ulcer. Okay, it is an ulcer. It is greater than six weeks in duration. Okay, we basically define a medullins ulcer as having a previous scar formation. It can happen in burn patients, post-trauma patients, and it's when the scar is eventually overwhelmed by squamous cell carcinoma. So if nobody's familiar with this, this is a typical area. This is actually in the trochanter area, and this patient came in with a big cauliflower on her hip, trochanter. And Everybody just wanted to say that, you know, it's, it's just a good squamous cell carcinoma. Well, it is, but if you go into the history, the history was is that she was previously bedridden and actually she had a pressure injury in the trochanter and it healed, okay, but she had extensive scar tissue. And what is very common amongst extensive scar tissue is the risk for these medullin ulcers to develop, which is actually squamous cell carcinoma, okay? So how does that help you? It says that she is at risk. Okay, this patient died, but what I'm saying, because it was not identified, I mean, this cauliflower has been there for months, if not years, and it was treated by antibiotics by the GP. So at some point, and I'm just telling everybody, if you see anything that looks for a, like a cauliflower, okay, an ulcer is generally below the level, <laughs> a carcinoma of any sort is generally above the level. So anything that looks like a cauliflower, please biopsy and do not throw antibiotics at it. Okay. So beyond that, when we're talking about pressure injuries generally, we're talking about a financial burden, we're talking about a physical burden to the patient, but to the family, and we're talking about a huge mental burden. Now, see, since COVID, we seem to be talking more about mental health these days. Um, but I think that we really need to bring that forward because if you are suffering with a pressure injury and you are copus mentis, it actually takes a big toll on your body. Um, and your mental, as most, as most people will know, if your mental capacity is a little bit deteriorating and you are struggling, you're den generally going to struggle physically also. So getting everything in moderation, but also in balance, would be the, the best. So the rest of my time this morning, I'm going to try and focus in on what do we know globally. I always like to start off with a global perspective. I think it's important for us to understand that you're not alone. <laughs> this is happening everywhere. Okay. Um, some countries are doing it really well. Some aren't doing it so well. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand.
Second of all, I want to look at what are the changes to the recommendations. So there are international recommendations. There's a couple of large lobby groups um, related to pressure injuries. And they basically have recommendations and an international consensus. And thankfully, a lot of people are doing the work for us. So we need to thank them <laughs> because it's a lot of work. And as I'd like to remind everybody, the bums in South Africa are the same as the bums in Mauritius, which is the same as the bums in, in, in the States, and it's the same as the bums in Canada. So we basically all could take this information and apply it at, to your area. Your area might be a little bit different. Your clinical area might be a little bit different. Okay, It might have different um, incidence and prevalence. It might have different conditions. Okay, And I'll be showing that in a minute. But the basic premise of the international guidelines can be applied within this country. The big one I want to look at is the care bundles. And if you haven't looked at that or even being aware of it, I'll make you aware of it today to make you maybe a little bit more comprehensive in your taking from a risk assessment into a physical intervention. And heels, my big um, sort of beef in this world is the heel ulcers. Okay, second largest um, pressure injury internationally and probably the one that is evaded most of the time. And finally, we're going to be talking about nutrition and pressure injuries and where do we, what do we need to know and where can we go from there. Okay. So, let's look internationally first. This is just a very good map to say what is the primary condition that affects these countries. Okay, and thereby how I was trying to interpret it is how does that affect the risk of pressure injuries, okay? If you look, I mean, if you look at North America where I'm from, heart disease is prevalent. I mean, we now have a high incidence of 45, 40 to 45 year old women dying of myocardial infarctions in Canada. I used to work in the emergency department in Canada I think I was shocked if someone came in at 65, a, a female coming in at 65 and having a heart attack. So heart disease is rife. There's a lot of reasons for it. We're not going into heart disease today, but there are a lot of reasons. So you can see that the majority of the world is actually suffering from heart disease. But interesting enough, not down here. Okay. So where does that bring us to again? How can we take that information and put it into pressure injuries? Well, if we're not doing so well with HIV AIDS, okay, AIDS sort of being the, the focus that I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to, is that those patients sometimes not only die of AIDS, but they actually die of pressure injuries due to their fr fragility, okay? We need to give them compassion. We need to give them prevention. Okay, and this is a big issue with related, related to some of our um, long-term conditions. So in South Africa, as of, as of 2019, according to the WHO, okay, number two is respiratory infections, which also makes people bedridden for long periods of time. We're talking about, you know, our tuberculosis. Even though tuberculosis is down here, respiratory infections can be anything like our COVID. Okay. That gentleman you first saw with the pressure injury on his, um, on his nasal area. Ischemic heart disease, also one of the highest risks, well, mo comorbidities related to risk of pressure in injury development, and stroke, with diabetes not being far behind. And we're going to be talking about that with, when we're talking about peripheral vascular and our prevention of heel ulcers with the diabetic patient, which is not being addressed very well at all. Okay. If we look at the most common chronic conditions contributing to pressure injuries internationally or globally, the first one is diabetes, which is quite on the rise in this country. Does anybody know what the current status is of diabetes in this country? I'm talking about type 2, not type 1. It's about 22% of the population with 14 years on average of people going without being diagnosed. 
It's become almost routine in our practice. My husband's a surgeon and it's almost become routine that we do, unfortunately, just a fasting blood glucose and a hemoglobin A1C when they come in for other surgical problems because nobody wants to go and spend money on getting their sugars checked. Okay. Something to think about, stroke and dementia. And I'm really glad that in one of the other sessions, someone's gonna be talking about dementia today. Dementia is, is another disease. I actually spoke to a neurologist the other day before I came here today just to get a sense as to how much dementia he's seeing. And in a very small practice, he would probably say about 70% of what he sees is dementia. And we're not, and he said to me, he says like normally we would have said like, over 75, over 80, he's seeing demented patients in their 50s. So this is something that is not well diagnosed. It is making patients frail, infirmed, and we really need to become very aware of mental changes and not just put it down to depression and throw some, some great drugs at people. Okay. So the incidence and prevalence numbers throughout the world globally Okay, is this is in hospitalized adult patients, all right? We basically are looking that the statistics increase as we get older. I think we can all assume that with unfortunately females being a little bit on the higher of the risk factor, okay, for pressure injuries. But globally, one in 10 adults admitted to a hospital will sustain a pressure injury. Hopefully only a stage one or a stage two. Where do all these guidelines come from? A slew of countries, <laughs> all over. Thankfully, almost every single website that you look at now, most countries are getting involved with this prevention initiative um, and getting involved and making sure that we fully understand, sorry, I'll just bring it up here, that we fully understand that there is a global perspective that we need to look at. And Certainly, these are the big ones, the NPIAP, okay, and the UPA. And those, those are the ones that have conferences every single year, and they have consensus documents you can always download. The last consensus document that I'm going to be referring to today is the 2019. The one before that was the 2014. So we're hoping every five years or so to bring out another consensus document. So we're almost at that point where they should be looking at the research. Okay. So I pulled, I extracted from the 2019 a couple of points that I think are important when we talk about risk. And, um, and I'm gonna highlight them. And the differences that they made and why they made this recommendation from 14 to 19, I think that's important, is that even though we make recommendations in previous years, we learn more, we experience more, we have outcomes, and we need to address and look at those outcomes and see whether they were very good for that, that clinical area or whether we needed to improve, et cetera. So I think our way of evaluating from 14 to 19 is actually a good way of looking at this. So if we look at just a set, so if we look at 22.1, um, which is just what I extracted and the recommendations from change from 2014, was that to assess the health-related quality of life, knowledge and, and, and self-care skills of individuals at risk for pressure injuries, okay? And basically looking at an educational plan. The how this changed is that they wanted to improve the use of the pressure ulcer or injury specific assessment tool. So as I said to you at the beginning, these tools are, are, have become check sheets, generally. Remember, I'm always being general. They're tick, 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 thankfully I got it over with, I can go and have a cup of tea. It's not that simple. You need to take that, and if, if you feel in this room that your risk assessment tool is not appropriate for the area that you work, and maybe it has not been evaluated in years, then address it. There are a lot of people in this room that can take that information, address it, and facilitate changes in that, clinical, that clinically specific area. Okay? Also, considering the quality of life issue. Does it address the quality of life? So the patient is incontinent. Okay? As we all know, incontinence is not a great quality of life. <laughs> 
It's not going to get you out to the mall. It's not going to allow you to visit family members when there is a odor associated with your incontinence. It really affects your quality of life. So by your specific assessment tool, is it addressing, I'm just using incontinence as an example, but is it addressing that in terms of the quality of life of a care-specific plan for that patient individually? Okay. Finally, they need to be able to take the findings of the risk assessment tool and individualize, as I've just mentioned. So it's not as simple as saying, we have this blanket document, we found that mobility and incontinence is an issue, and now we're just gonna basically implement that over the entire ward. It's not gonna work, okay? It has to be an individual plan. The next recommendation is basically looking at 1.22, it's not gonna mean anything to you, but conducting a full pressure risk assessment, okay? after admission and then when there is a change to the patient, okay? It has to be readdressed. I see it many times being done either in the emergency department or into a ward wherever they go, ICU, surgical ward, and then never looked at again. The patient is there for two to four weeks. They've had septicemia, maybe post-operative septicemia, dehiscement of their, of their wound, okay? And they're still on that, they were perfect when they came in, right? Because it was elective surgery. Tick, 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 no, no, now, two weeks later, they're incontinent. No one's gone back to that risk assessment. Okay, I'm just throwing out examples. So if you're doing that, I'm fa that's great, but this is, a recommendation that it's an initial assessment done within 8 to 12 hours of admission and then a reassessment once there is a change in the patient and or practice. Okay, The skin assessment is actually very interesting um, and I think again it really brings back, back us as practitioners back to our basic levels and I'm not saying the pressure injury is basic it can affect a patient, as we said, financially, mentally, and physically. So we need to look at this seriously. So this change from um, recommendation from 2014 was to make skin assessment the forefront of your assessment criteria. Okay, number one, assess the temperature of the skin. Okay, we need to understand how warm that patient is. Now, I'm not talking about taking a thermometer and finding out their core temperature, which, yes, is important in certain aspects of care, okay? But we're talking about temperature of the body, okay? Are the feet cold? Peripheral vascular disease. Is the buttocks warm, indicating increased risk of inflammation to the area, possibly due to pressure? possibly due to a central core temperature change, possibly due to SIRS. Maybe it's just the surface they're on and it's gonna, they're gonna sweat on it and they're more diaphoretic and the surface needs to be changed. Okay. So assessing the temperature of the patient when you're caring for them and rolling them is really important. Consider the sub-epidermal moisture. Again, we're looking at inflammatory response, okay? And this can be looked at in various ways. It can just be felt, okay, palpated, all right? We can do our palpation to see whether we have a dip in that inflammatory response. But there's actually now measurement tools, okay? Arjo actually has this product in other countries, maybe in this country sometime soon, you never know. Um, but basically it's a SEM device, so we're looking at sub-epidermal moisture. And what they've noticed by being able to measure the sub-epidermal moisture is that we can actually, first of all, predict a pressure injury, possibly, and we can minimize the amount of inflammation to that area by knowing that it, co that it coexists within the patient. Okay? It's very difficult to eyeball inflammation. And especially when you're looking at a buttocks versus a buttocks, that's very difficult. Now, 
a heel versus a heel, you can. But again, are, are your eyes working well? I mean, I'm now starting to wear glosses, <laughs> you know, these sort of things. So you might need to get another colleague in to assess that level of inflammation. Whereas this machine actually takes it away for you. So it levels the amount of subepidermal moisture, okay, to minimize that risk of pressure ulcer um, identification. Okay, and why, while I'm on inflammation, I really would like us to understand inflammation better because this is the key to pressure injury development. So a lot of people think that it is the vascular supply, which it is, but the vascular supply leads to an inflammatory response. And it's the amount of inflammatory response that stays within the area for a period of time that induces the lack of blood supply to the area which eventually causes the pressure injury. So if you actually knew where they were in terms of your patient, in terms of the amount of inflammatory response, you would actually be able to facilitate minimizing it before it ever got to chronic inflammation and certainly before we get to a fibrogenesis, which is basically a fibrosis of tissue, scar tissue. So you can have scar tissue in an area of pressure without having had beyond a, a stage two of pressure injury. So your stage one being inflammation, okay, without an opening as yet, that, if it's a long chronic inflammation, can cause local scar tissue to develop, which will eventually become fibrotic. And that scar tissue, bringing lack of blood supply to the area, will induce and have a risk to further develop an, a pressure injury in the future, whether it's, uh, the future is a day from now or whether the future is six months from now when they become um, immobile again. So that's really important. Along with that, how do we understand our immune system? As soon as we have a shift in, in inf inflammatory response somewhere in the body, we will have an immune shift also. And this is also really, really important when we talk about wound care and the development thereof. And as I said, it can be as simple as a stage one that is not seen clinically as a wound as yet, but as a pressure injury wound care, and anybody in wound care in this room will appreciate, is that any inflammatory change within skin is a wound until proven otherwise. Because why is it inflamed? Okay. So you need to look at what happens at the beginning to the end, and these, this, this basically evolution of our inflammatory reaction, our anti-inflammatory reaction, our cytokine development, our histamine, our, all of our growth factors, okay, coming into the area and then leaving and coming in again. So the reason why I put this up is you've got a patient, okay, and prior to surgery, for example, they had no infl inflammation in their pressure areas at all. They go off and they have a hip replacement, they come back, and you notice eight hours later that they now have a stage one inflamed, reddened, compromised area. So you take them off that area. Two days later, they're still not mobilizing well, and someone's put them back on that area, and now they're red again, but probably not in six hours, probably in two hours. So that constant re-traumatization, if you want to call it, that constant inflammatory response on, off, on, off, will have a shorter effect and will have a longer healing time. So you identifying that risk to a patient is extremely important. The last part of skin assessment is actually interesting um, on pigment because the one thing that well, I'm, it, I was going to say me, I've learned in South Africa, quite honestly, if you've ever been to Canada, we are a multinational nation also, is that in order for you to assess, because everybody wants to go by redness in a inflamed criteria or assessment. It's not as simple as that when we have different hues and color. And this McCreef color chart 
is actually very interesting because this has been used to identify the different hues of color related to inflammatory response for many years now and it's actually statistically significant that if you have a hue of color of your skin and you slightly change the hue that that would actually be statistically significant in terms of your thema in that patient and identifying inflammatory response. So the skin tone was more predictive to skin damage, okay, than the race or the ethnicity in the trunk location, okay? So it's really important if you can identify on a skin chart, which was also a change from 2014 to 2019, basically the implementation of a skin chart to identify the color and the hue of the skin in relation to inflammatory response. So, going into bundles now. Okay. A lot of people have looked at trying to implement, so we're now beyond risk assessment, and now we're going into assessment. Okay. A lot of people have seen ASKIN, which is this. A lot of people have seen ESKIN. There's a lot of variations depending on how people have decided to take on these bundles and implement them within your clinical area, within your country, within your province, within your hospital, whatever you want to implement. Any way you look at it, A can either be assessment, and that's assessment of the skin, but it can also be a more comprehensive assessment to the overall body, or it could be the S, which is skin, which is looking at only skin assessment. So whichever way you want to look at it, take this as an introduction if you're not familiar with care bundles, to see this as an introduction to care bundles and how you can take your risk assessment and now apply it to a care bundle. Okay. So care bundles are a set of assessment criteria that are evidence-based to show that we can make a difference in reducing risk based on this assessment that's within this care bundle. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing, and you can see here, this is just an example from the UK actually, okay, how they took the care bundle and they made it, you see here, they decided to use skin surface, but they made it a, basically a, a marketing tool to patients and to, to, um, to the family members, and this was all over the hospital. So that not only are the nurses and the physicians and everybody else familiar and the allied health professionals familiar, but also the families, which is really, really important if you want to get them involved and encouraging them, especially getting mo mobility going um, within these patients, it's really important for us to do that. So we can look at ASKIN, ESKIN, whichever way you want to look at it, but we're just going to go through each one of them so that there's a, a better understanding. So number one, when we look at the assess or the skin, you need to assess throughout the risk. So there's the risk assessment tool, which we're looking at, Brad, um, Waterloo, I always add them together, Bradlow, <laughs> Braden or Waterloo, Norton or whatever else you're using. Okay, taking that to the next step, which is the skin assessment. In any of those, they're not specific enough for you to do a skin assessment. So even though broadly, Braden and Waterloo are asking very broadly what is the skin like in terms of dry, moist, etc. The skin assessment should be very specific, okay, in terms of risk of pressure injury, what are you feeling, what are you touching, palpation, etc. And that's where something like maybe that SEM that some um, technology would come in. I'm going to be talking about the peripheral vascular assessment a little bit later when we talk about the lower limb, and I think that's really important. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people do a peripheral vascular assessment, so I'm talking either a lower limb Doppler, which would be done in radiology, or an ABPI, which is an ankle brachial pressure index, on your patients when they're admitted to know what their peripheral vascular level is. Okay. I see a couple hands, but it is a real area of neglect, especially when we talk about patients that are diabetic. Okay, 
Now there's some controversy around that and when I get into heels, I'll talk to you about that controversy and where the evidence lies. And then finally, looking at another clear assessment is based on the BMI of a patient. Okay, and the water low goes into the BMI, but Braden doesn't. Okay, so if it's not in the assessment tool that you're using, please use a BMI. It is a broad understanding as to where this patient sits in obesity to Kakechik. Okay, we need to understand what their risk is on either spectrum of the BMI scale. Finally, with all that in mind, is the surface appropriate to the risk identified? Okay. This is somewhat really important, and I do in the care bundles would like to make it very simple and say, if you set out a criteria, if this patient is either at this level of Waterloo or this level of Braden, then they get this surface. Or, as simple as, all chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients get a surface. Or, do all peripheral vascular disease patients get a surface? I'm throwing it out there as blanket criteria. Okay. That is also a way of using the risk assessment tool to identify the risks within that patient and put together specific clinical criteria that would automatically deem that those patients are at high risk and therefore need a surface. But again, if you can't show your administration incidence and prevalence, they are not gonna pay for a bed. Hate to say it that way, but they're not. So, let's see if that can work. I know there are many um, ICUs within South Africa and outside of South Africa, specifically Middle East where I've spent a lot of my time, that as soon as you have CHF, diabetic, and a BMI over a certain amount, not even 35 like, it, like it's in this country, I think it's over 28 in other countries and less than less than 20, I believe, I can't remember exactly, you automatically get a surface, okay, regardless of your skin assessment. Okay. So there are some clinical areas that you can look at just a, basically applying a comorbidity to a surface. Keeping moving, okay, so everybody should know what that means, the ability to be able to move in bed, from bed to other locations, being able to assess that, Okay, and the need for any sort of assistive device, especially assistive devices that will increase the risk of pressure, such as prosthesis and, and other assistive devices. Okay? I think what's really interesting when we talk about keep moving is still this, um, this incredible way we have in hospitals to make patients infirmed, meaning that why do we only offer beds to patients and not chairs. I was amazed before I went in for, yes, my colonoscopy and gastroscopy because I'm over 50. Um, when I went in, I was automatically given a bed. And I said, I can walk to the room. It's not a problem. And they said, but yeah, you're coming in for a procedure. And I said, yeah, but I my procedure is not involving my legs or my arms. <laughs> um, I just think we need to look at that um, a little bit more readily in the areas that you work. Yes, obviously beds are a caring um, way of, of, of caring for people, and yes, most sick individuals do want a bed, but there is a point to which we need chairs available for these patients, um, especially the walking ambulatory. Um, we need to make them and continue to make them walking ambulatory, okay? And incontinence. Um, I tell this story all the time, but, um, but I think that there's a huge need that um, in the States, not in Canada as far as I understand now, I have not worked in Canada for a while now, um, but according to my 
uh, friends and colleagues, it has not been implemented. But the states likes to compartmentalize a lot of specialties. And they've actually brought in the specialty, which I don't disagree with, is actually an incontinence nurse. Where this incontinence nurse, that's what she does all day, is goes around to patients that have been identified as either chronic con um, incontinence that has come in, or has basically developed a acute incontinence, depending on their condition. And this nurse basically works on, hopefully, um, turning around the incontinence to an, a continent phase. And I think in this world of um, basically mental capacity, um, dementia, um, and a lot of other comorbidities associated with um, our frailty within hospitals, I think an incontinence nurse would be ideal. Because it takes a lot of time out of the clinical day <laughs> taking care of incontinence, does it not? Okay, and a, and a good contributor to risk when we talk about pressure injuries. Okay, so just an example of Waterloo in a big Waterloo space. <laughs> um, I think what we need to do is we need to look at certain areas, okay, like we look at the BMI and is that appropriate when we talk about ASKIN and applying it, yes I do, okay how this is very defined. A BMI is a very defined criteria, okay, to figure out your BMI. Not so much so is basically when we look at tissue malnutrition, okay. When we look at, yes, multiple versus single, we can understand that peripheral vascular disease and anemia with a hemoglobin less than, less than eight, okay. That is also very clinically defined. But when you start getting into patients like, you know, you may, I mean, one person might say they're clammy and pyrexil, and then another patient might say, no, 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 I, I felt that they were dry this morning. So it's a very subjective. Um, and that is why it's always nice, and if you can, and I know it's not always possible, and what is recommended is that two clinicians, two practitioners, actually go and assess the patient for the assessment risk, okay? I know it's time consuming. I know you don't always have a lot of hands, but it would be good to get that initial one with two heads, looking at the patient in very, hopefully, more objective ways, but yes, there is some subjectivity to this assessment. Okay, and basically when we look at, uh, the, I'm just actually putting over here a little bit more of, an, of a focus, that we have to assess the need for the catheterization and whether it's necessary or not, okay? There's a general norm and feeling that cathetera catheters stay in much longer than necessary out of not necessarily the patient's need, but out of, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> I'm gonna say convenience. And it's not, and it's actually sometimes to the convenience of, of the clinicians too, so the practitioners. So um, that should always be assessed. And again, as I said, if you had an incontinence nurse, I don't know why they call them incontinence. You'd think they'd want the positive side, which would be the continence, continent nurse, um, that they would come and assess that and deem and try and get them through, you know, their bladder bladder um, renegotiation and stuff like that. So, and that's why I bring in the incontinence nurses at the bottom. Okay. I think the only other thing I want to mention here is that all pressure injuries require a special surf surface, and that's what's been recommended internationally. So if there is an existing pressure injury, it requires a surface. Okay. And I know that's not happening, so, again, we need to be advocates for our patients, and we need to make sure that this occurs, okay, and facilitate it. Okay. So, there are many risks in specific population groups that we need to be aware of. I think what, what is general norm is the immune compromised. So, we're talking about our cancer patients. Even our trauma, so that, I mean, cancer being more of a long-term palliative um, notion, 
But when we talk about immune systems being compromised, we're talking about trauma patients, burn patients, okay, to, as I said, the more palliative, which is more our cancer patients. With those types of patients, we generally have compromised mobility, okay? And multiple comorbidities. As we mentioned in the beginning, the top three globally that contribute to pressure injuries, diabetes, ischemic, and stroke, okay? And finally, the use of the abundance amount of medical devices increases risk. Being aware of whether those devices are necessary, getting rid of them when they're not necessary. Okay, for all those that worked through COVID, the difficulty with the CPAPs and the BiPAPs, okay, and just being able to nurse those patients without creating any, any pressure was an issue. Okay. I put this out there. For those that might think that pressure injuries, because we, we go on and on about the risk and, and their ability to be able to be avoided. Are there any that are unavoidable? Interesting enough, there is. So for those that might have seen I was being a little bit doubtful and maybe a little bit negative in the first hour, <laughs> I'm going to tell you there are points and times that at which a patient may not be able to avoid a pressure injury. So this was a retrospective study done, okay, yes, in an ICU, in a critical care area, on 165 patients, okay, where basically 67% were hospital-acquired pressure injuries, and they were unavoidable, okay? Their criteria is over here, as you can see. So tissue tolerance, looking at perfusion, nutrition, um, skin status, et cetera, and then the mechanical loads that were, based, that were put on the patient, okay? Decreased activity, increased everything. So mechanical loads versus tissue tolerance, okay, which we, we assess in various ways, go into a possibility of a pressure injury. And is one avoidable or not avoidable? What was proved in this study was that the unavoidable of the 41% that had hospital-acquired pressure injuries were mainly congestive heart failure, okay, chemically sedated patients, a systolic pressure less than 90, and at least on one vasopressor. So for all those that work in ICU or CCU, okay, I'm sure all of you can agree that if we looked at any of those basically comorbidities but plus um, conditions at which the patient is put at, those generally compromise a patient to the point of unavoidable pressure injuries. Okay? They went on so far as to say that although st not statistically significant in this research, okay, that a previous pressure injury was almost unavoidable to get another one, okay? That if they did not have good bowel management systems in place, that also contributed to an un unavoidable. And each hospital stay increased the risk of an unavoidable by 4%. And finally, the good old smoker. So, there is, I think most of us believed that there was, that pressure injuries are always unavoidable. Yes, for the most part, but there are a few areas that allow it not to be unavoidable, okay? So take this in, into consideration when you're nursing in those areas. So heel ulcers. Let's talk heel ulcers. And I'm sure many of you sitting in this room today can think of a heel ulcer. Maybe you even were looking at yesterday and <laughs> thinking, my goodness, this has become relevant. Globally, 
it moved from the sixth most common area of pressure to the second. Okay, mainly due to peripheral vascular disease associated with diabetes. Okay. The next one is the global prevalence is approximately 51% of all stage 3 and stage 4 pressure injuries. Okay. Not moving as fast as I'd like to. Globally, the incidence of hospital acquired pressure injuries can range from 1.3 to 54% interoperatively and postoperatively and is multifactorial, being the heel ulcer, preoperatively and postoperatively. Okay? And according, <coughs> this is going really slow, according to the study in Australia, the greatest risk of pressure injury is the lack of knowledge of the nurses and specific care considerations within specific care areas, okay? And that is really, really important. And I'm not saying it's because the nurses in the study or the nurses in this room don't have the knowledge. It's because we are overwhelmed with other areas and aspects of the care that we are working in that we might forget. And every year, as we are doing today, we need to update and remind you of what the newest research is and what we need to be looking at, okay? So let's go through the new newest research. So this Rivolo, if anybody wants to look up this paper, is actually a very interesting paper. And he went through a consensus report of a global um, look at all the assessment prevention criteria throughout the world. So a good lich search. But then on top of that, came up with a consensus document. So if we look at these five areas, and why I picked out these five areas is because when he looked at the research and the literature surrounding heel ulcers globally, um, not all recommendations were highly rated, meaning that they had mild um, statistically significant outcomes in terms of changes. So as much as we think that, you know, one thing is great, it may not be statistically significant in terms of why we should implement that change. So let's first look at ABPI assessment. This is an interesting one. So even though I, I said to you how many people know about an ABPI and how many people know how to do an ABPI, um, it's not necessarily the gold standard in terms of peripheral vascular assessment. So one of the biggest problems is, is that the diabetics and the non-diabetics have somewhat of a different peripheral vascular system, not saying that they have a different <laughs> vascular system, it means that we cannot use an ABPI criteria in a diabetic patient with the risk of them being highly stenotic and calcium, basically calcified. So if the diabetics have had diabetes for a long time and they have peripheral vascular disease due to um, basically calcium-induced um, arterial sclerosis, we cannot assess them effectively with an ABPI. Okay? That has been proven. One of the other problems, okay, is that we have a limited assessment using an ABPI. Most people use the dorsal pedialis pulse as your assessment pulse within the lower limb, okay? The most common area, or the most common innervation by blood supply and nerve supply to the heel area is the peri perineal nerve and artery. And if you use the dorsal pedialis as your assessment point of pulse, you are not gonna be assessing the perineal artery. So it becomes almost not necessary to be doing an ABPI unless you are going to do the anterior 
or sorry, the posterior um, tibialis, where the per perineal is. So posterior tibialis is behind the lateral malleoli and posterior to the mat mat lateral malleoli. And that's where you should ass be assessing the pulse and that's the one you should use on the ABPI. If you were to do that, then you would have direct relationship to the artery that is supplying the heel area. Is that making sense to everyone? Great. Very, very important. As I said, not to be relied on with the diabetics, okay, due to calcification of the arteries. Okay. But what is recommended is that they should go for so if it is a known peripheral vascular, or even not known peripheral vascular, and they are diabetic, they should be sent for a Doppler study, a radiological Doppler study, as opposed to a bedside ABPI. Okay, everybody's familiar with how to do an ABPI, right? Okay, there's some people that are probably, okay, maybe I've just gone over people's heads. ABPI stands for Ankle Brachial Pressure Index. It is a, a basically a measurement of the amount of arterial blood supply that is reaching the lower limb and is based on uh, basically a percentage. So what you do is you take a brachial systolic pressure and you take an ankle systolic pressure and you can do both limbs and both, both so both upper arms and you can do both lower, lower limbs. If you're worried about one leg over another leg, we suggest you always do two brachial. Take the lower of the two, not the higher. Take the lower of the two. So if one is 120 and the other one is, is 30, you're gonna take the 120. Then on the limb that is affected, you can do both limbs if you're doing just a general assessment. But on the limb that is affected, it would be what is that systolic pressure of that limb where we take our Doppler, we take our cuff, and we do a systolic pressure. Say, for example, your systolic pressure of the lower limb is 60. I'm going to use simple numbers for my simple brain. You put basically A over B or ankle over brachial. So it would be 60 on 120. That is 0.5 or 50% blood flow to that limb. That would make that limb severe peripheral vascular disease. Okay? So the criteria above 70 or 0.7, so 70% or 0.7, is a mixed disease, being vascular and, and, and venous. So basically, we're looking at arterial and venous mixed disease at about 70%. Above that, it's pretty much just venous problems, compromise. Below 0.6 or 60%, you go into severe arterial disease. Okay. All right. Perfect. Sorry, I, I, I glossed over that, and there's probably some people in this room that would not have known that. Okay. There's also another measurement tool that has been used in, for peripheral vascular disease, and it's not readily available. It is in some critical care areas and a few other areas. It's basically the um, TCPO2. So again, what is the recommendation is that a TCPO2, you can see it's actually transcutaneous, um, basically peripheral oxygen. So that's what we're looking at here. So it's measuring that on each toe. It can measure it on the foot. And it's basically the assessment of the arteries again. Much more specific, especially to the toes and to the superficial aspects of the foot. Um, and this is, again, limited assessment when we're talking about heel perfusion. Because if you're assessing the dorsum of the foot and the toes and everything else, it's not going to assess how much perfusion is in the heel. That's again where the Doppler comes in. The next one in terms of assessment, okay, and the use of, is the use of occlusive dressings. Now not only are people using occlusive dressings for wounds, when you have an open wound, but you're also using occlusive dressings. I don't know if you know the study that was done at Addington 
hospital in KwaZulu-Natal about almost 30 years ago now, where they used occlusive dressings on peripheral vascular disease, specifically um, uh, neuro impairment or basically uh, neurovascular disease in diabetics, and where they used to get that burning sensation into their foot. And what they did is they they used an occlusive dressing on the dorsum of the foot to minimize that exposure of the exposed nerves in the foot to the air, to the oxygen. And by putting an occlusive dressing on the dorsum of the foot, you minimize that nerve innervation that you would get from the exposed nerves. Has anybody heard of this local research? Local being South Africa. <laughs> so occlusive dressings are commonly still being used in um, diabetic neuropathy. Um, and although they're good, what they will do is they will, um, they will not be good for pressure injury prevention. So occlusive dressings, whether it's for a prevention of um, the neuropathic innervation and decreasing pain, or for a wound itself, it should not be used. Okay? It is very few times that for wounds in a foot and or heel area that I would ever use an occlusive dressing. I will generally use foam dressings, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, okay, in a prevention and a treatment modality. Okay. As I said, foam dressings. So there are various types of foam dressings. Okay. So what I want to and that and what I want to talk, talk about is basically the look at the low friction technology. So in the heel losses, when we're looking from a prevention point of view, there's been a lot of use of the multi-layered foam dressings recently. Everybody familiar to those dressings that I'm, I'm more referring to these ones and a little bit more multi-layered. Anybody familiar with these dressings? Most people? Okay. All right. The reason why they've become quite popular for prevention is because there has been a couple studies that have come out that they will reduce so a multi-layer foam, not just a single layer. So that's a single layer foam, and that's also a single layer foam. But the multi-layered foam, and there's a few companies that make them, that would decrease, not only take, wick away the, um, the moisture of the heel area into the foam itself, minimizing the amount of moisture to the area, because most of these these occlusive dressings people want to call occlusive are not occlusive. The, what you guys know as opsite or the adhesive dressing portion of it is not an opsite as we know traditionally. It is a highly permeable, so they've made most of these dressings highly permeable. We call it moisture, moist, moisture vapor permeability. And these are so highly permeable that the risk of collecting moisture underneath is, is almost minuscule because it will accommodate even the highest amount of um, perspiration. And heels don't pers perspire all that often anyways. It's not one of the high, high areas. So with these multi-layers as prevention, what they noticed is that when the patient was constantly moving down the bed and you shear effect them back up the bed and they friction down the bed and you shear effect them up the bed again, that multi-layer foam was able to take away and shear on its own self. And that was its advantage. And I'm sure you'll notice that if you just used a heel ulcer prevention product like that, that even when you moved it, unless you secured it very well, it would actually still move on the heel still not preventing the friction and shear and the movement of the patient in the bed. So it's the multi-layered, okay, not occlusive, but it's a semi-occlusive adhesive dressing that the original research was done on. Does that make sense to everyone? I'm sure a lot of you are using that for, in your prevention models, okay, and that's fine, but it has to be the right one, okay. I'm going to move on to nutrition now. I have about another 20 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so. I know it's been quick. I had to go through these topics succinctly, but I'm hoping that you're getting a, a little bit from each topic. 
Why don't we talk about malnutrition versus undernutrition? Okay, there's actually a di there's actually a difference in the two of them. The ability so when someone comes in and presents into your hospital, and you think that they are the little cachectic auntie that's coming in and they're under nutritioned. It's very different from undernutrition versus malnutrition. Okay, it's an undernutrition patient is the ability of the body to not be able to fight inf infection related to the nutrition that they're getting, okay? Which is going to impact and have a huge risk of pressure injury development. Okay. There are certain conditions that will lead to undernutrition, such as a dependence on others to feed them, okay? There's a real need in this world to have people feeding patients in the hospital. Because it's not very good that if you're lying in bed here and the, in the, <laughs> the cart is way over there with your nice tray that, and you can't get to it because you can't mobilize, okay? Again, um, making sure that patients have some sort of care or facility to get to their nutrition. Decreased oral intake or f of food or liquid, okay? Oral intake is still very necessary, even though many of our patients will rely on uh, G-tube feedings and stuff like that. Okay, the oral is still, when it is synthesized within um, the stomach and orally gratification comes in, we actually start the enzymatic response immediately. And so the absorption of nutrients from the oral cavity down into the stomach is really important. When that cannot be done, and it is through a, a PEG or through um, TPN, um, we lose some of the nutrition in, in, that, um, in that, that way of giving that sort of food to patients. This compromises their nutritional status. Unintentional weight loss is the first thing we, we constantly are inquiring to patients. And that should be actually part of your assessment criteria, is even though a patient may be quite obese when they come in, they might actually be, have a loss of, of weight prior to them coming to, to you. So even though a patient comes in maybe overweight in your eyes, you should be asking them, and their BMI is through the roof, you should still be asking them, have you had any weight loss recently? Because a, you assume that a cachectic patient is malnourished. You don't assume that an obese patient is malnourished. That's the wrong assumption. Okay, and we'll go through the nutrition in a minute. And obviously advancing, advancing age. Okay, the one that's not in here, that should be in here, is actually we really struggled with our COVID patients and the lack of satiety or the want for, for food, and also with the decrease in taste. There wasn't a lot of want for food during COVID or a COVID patient. So when we look at the wasting disease associated with undernutrition or malnutrition, we look at a metabolic condition of wasting. And so if we can look at aging and inactivity, being basically a decrease in protein synthesis. We don't process our, our, our proteins as well as we do when we were younger. And the illness and injury with the lack of process of um, protein again. Okay, we break it down in our body. Um, I always refer back to the burn patient, you know, where they are such at a high metabolic state due to their injury that they are burning energy so quickly that they're processing their protein without it basically lending to the body's nutrition at all, okay? So it compromises and starts to break down our ketoacidosis, starts to break down um, into a ketonic state. So when we look at the risk factors associated with nutrition. We have a compromised state when a patient comes in, no matter what the medical um, comorbidities are, okay? We possibly have a lean body mass. Inflammation, again, we go back to the inflammatory response. It's really important, yes or no? No, probably related to starvation, um, an anorexic state, okay? So this would be more anorexic. Uh, 
If inflammation is present, then we're looking at, is it mild or moderate degree, okay? When we saw, again, sorry, I'm bringing in different ideas, when you think about COVID or burn patients, they are markedly infl inflamed, therefore they would be under inflammatory response, and then we have to look at them in a very different um, nutritional status as opposed to the moderate, okay, where there is organ failure. So when a patient is cachectic, they are basically having, they are at a point to which the metabolic syndrome has taken over and they're breaking down protein quite readily. All right, and associated to that is basically the anorexic patient, okay, where they cannot take enough in to basically balance that metabolic state. Inflammation and infection, which we've already mentioned. Insulin resistance, so that is our type two diabetics. Increased pro muscle protein breakdown, all right? So that would be some, some patients that are in a tra traumatic situation, all right? And they've actually even noticed that trauma, mental trauma, okay, induces that metabolic waste, okay, and that breakdown. It's amazing, I think what we forget is how strong our brain is at, and its effect on the rest of our body. I'm sure everybody in this room can contest that when a patient wants to die, they, they will die. Because their brain will make them die. So the brain is a powerful tool to get them to the point of not having metabolic synthesis and severe disease, which we've spoken about before. So when we talk about some labs that we can look at, there's some baseline labs. I'm just gonna go forward one just so you can see these baseline and then I'm gonna go back. So when we look at screening for the risk in pressure injuries, this is actually recommendations best practice from um, the Canadian Wound Association. And they're saying that every single patient that has a risk, so as soon as you've done the risk assessment fact, um, the risk assessment tool, and they are at a a mild to medium to high risk, there is no reason why you cannot add these bloods on as a baseline for these patients. So looking at our CBC, you guys call it an FBC in this country, okay, so we're looking at a full blood count, all right, which will be inclusive of your hemoglobin, your white count, and then some red, red blood cells and, and breaking that down um, into its all, all its constituents. We need to look at the iron, why? There is a, a strong correlationship, amazingly enough, to pressure ulcer development and gastric ulcer syndrome. When we look at, and we're gonna talk about hemoglobin and the relationship to inflammation in a minute, what we noticed is that if a patient is slightly anemic and we have not determined the cause and we find out that it is actually a gastric ulcer, we have probably ignored the gastric ulcer in response to the risk of pressure injury. And if this pressure injury continues to develop, is at which time we should actually be looking at a potential cause being a gastric ulcer. Gastric ulcer increasing inflammatory response, decreasing he um, hemoglobin and iron levels, and thereby contributing to that pressure ulcer development. Now I know it seems like you know we're talking about sacrum versus internal ulcer, and you're saying, "Whoa, that's that's a that's a strange one." There's a lot written up on that on that relationship, and you might get an indication once you've done some bloods when a patient does not have to come in with the acute peptic ulcer syndrome in order to be able to be diagnosed with a gastric ulcer. Okay. Our CRP and our ESR, extremely valuable information. I'm gonna talk about procalcitonin in a minute also. So our, C our CRP is a broad, for those that aren't familiar with it, okay, it is a broad indicative or test that is indicative of a broad inflammatory response in the body. It's not specific to viral or bacterial, okay, or um, autonomic. So, or um, sorry, um, auto, auto disease. So we can use it as basically a base level for us to understand where we're at. We generally say that if a, C, a CRP is greater than eight and a patient has a pressure injury, 
you need to consider that that pressure injury might have bacterial infection, and at which point you should be taking a swab. Okay. Just for those that are more sort of in the in the maybe surgical side and stuff, a CRP of like 300 would be indicative of a burst, <laughs> exactly, sepsis, a burst um, appendix, okay? So you can see the difference. A burst appendix has, peritone they're peritonotic, they're, they're, they're basically bacterial invasion into the peritoneal cavity, all those wonderful things, whereas a minor local infection in a wound without septicemia might only have a CRP of eight. Normal is less than five, so it's slightly elevated. Okay? So that's sort of where your CRP helps you determine where we're sitting in terms of the risk for pressure injury, but also possibly the treatment of a pressure injury. Pre-albumin and albumin is really important also. We need to get a baseline to understand where their protein reserves lie. Okay? Albumin is looking at albumin over a period of time. Pre-albumin is more immediate. Okay, so what we're looking at is the severity of illness. We will always do a pre-albumin prior to surgery to see where they're at and whether we can actually do surgery or not. Albumin is more the length of time. So we need to get both of those to get a very good understanding. An albumin of less than 20, we would, and you can see that is well below the low, the low norm there, we would really struggle to heal a wound. So say for example, you have a very necrotic heel ulcer or a sacral ulcer, and the clinician wants to take them in for a debridement surgically, okay, and they had an albumin level of 20. The likelihood of them even healing with that debridement, with the potential use of, of flap or skin graft or anything, would be almost stupid to do that surgery at that time. If you're doing a debridement to clear the tissue of bacteria and necrosis to hopefully minimize the risk of sepsis, that's a different indication. But if you're trying to take a patient for debridement and closure with an albumin of 20, it would be a silly thing to do. You need to bring up their reserves first in order for them to be able to facilitate that healing. BO and creatinine, it's always good to know where our kidney, our kidney um, uh, levels sit. And again, looking at our blood glucose, we need to, I mean, a fasting blood glucose isn't the best. Well, the fasting blood glucose is the best. A random is not good. So it would be best if the patient is admitted and they have eaten that you don't do the fasting till the next morning and fast them overnight. Okay, so you might want to add them, that one in the next day. But, it, but and the fasting is greater than um, 12 hours, eh? It's not six. I think there was a misunderstanding in quite a few labs that they thought it was six. It's actually a fasting is greater than 12. So a fasting glucose and a an um, hemoglobin A1C. You don't always have to do a hemoglobin A1C. You can throw it on later. It is a more expensive test. But once you've done your fasting and it is high, then I would be adding on a hemoglobin A1C to another blood test when you do it again. Okay? And thyroid, the reason why we do thyroid is because if we have an elevation, that will also alter the metabolic syndrome. And you need to know that. And again, unfortunately, we don't go through the regimented health checks that we need to do throughout our lives. So I think what I'm encouraging you, even as healthcare professionals here, um, and I'll just give you my little bit of Canadian side to me. In Canada, yes, we do have a free system. So it does make it more readily available and probably more abused in terms of our health care. Because you can go see a GP probably every day and no one would, well, someone would probably eventually say, why are you seeing the GP every day? <laughs> but it's a free system. So we get reminders. You're due for your colonoscopy, gastroscopy. You have not had your thyroid checked and you're over 45 and you're a female. You have not done this. You have not done that. When, when is your last mammo? And they send you SMSs all the time throughout Canada. 
And when I talk about keeping an eye on your own health, and I'm sure in this room, very few of you have ever gone for a health test, gone and had your bloods done, gotten a baseline, you know, it is so important when we look at our own health and we're talking about patient's health and getting a baseline, you need to think about your own health and getting a baseline. So if we go back, sorry, one, I wanna go back to why, so serum albumin we talked about, pre-albumin we talked about, okay. But now what we wanna talk about is the relationship of hypoalbuminuria, okay, I'm gonna go into hemoglobin in a minute, hypoalbuminuria in relationship to where it is in the pressure injury risk assessment. And what they're saying is that if you just looked at a, an albumin level in a patient being suboptimal, that would outweigh your risk assessment scale, your Waterloo, and your Braden scale if you add on your CRP. So let me be clear on this. By ignoring bloods in a patient and not think, thinking that they're necessary because they're coming in for a, another comorbidity such as you know, um, cardiac failure or something, you will be, and you don't add on a CRP because you didn't think it was necessary, you will be ignoring the risk of that pressure ulcer development by not doing a baseline when they came in to the point where even if you did a Braden scale, your CRP is more valuable to the inflammatory response than what you assessed on your risk assessment. It's really, really, really very important. Does that make sense to everyone? So you have to get some baselines. Okay. With inflammatory response, okay, we are looking at what is the co-relationship to inflammatory response and um, our lab values. So, Procalcitonin, so CRP is basically the breakdown within the liver and it is a shorter inflammatory response. Procalcitonin is a much longer prolonged inflammatory response and more specific to bacteria. So if you're worried about a bacterial infection in this patient, procalcitonin is the one you need to be relying on, where CRP is too broad and not specific to bacteria. Make sense? Now, interesting enough, with long-term wounds, okay, that you're worried about fungal because with your semi-quantitative swab, you're not going to be doing fungal, okay, so it's anaerobic. Your, if your CRP is elevated but a normal procalcitonin, you can almost assume fungal because, as I said, CRP is not indicative of bacterial, okay? Now, when we look at hemoglobin, white count, and RBCs. Increased inflammation is indicative of a decrease in hemoglobin, a decrease in red blood cells, and a decrease in albumin. So if you didn't have a baseline to notice those changes, you wouldn't know whether there was a decrease, which is now indicative of inflammation. As soon as you note infl inflammatory response, you should be considering that that is a precursor to pressure ulcer development. Okay. Come on. There we go. I know this is really a busy one, but I've given you the consensus you can document. You can look this up on the web, any of the websites, okay? And it basically goes through nutritional risk and everything else related. And what they're saying here is, it is highly recommended that you have to do a nutritional risk assessment, okay, with, with, with a pressure injury currently in situ. As a recommendation for those in terms of a high risk assessment without a pressure injury. So with a pressure injury, highly recommended. Without a pressure, inju without a pressure injury, um, a parent, then it is recommended. Provide one to one, one point two five to one point five grams of protein per kg. This is almost a Burns patient nutrition, okay? Because of the, the basically the metabolic synthesis of the protein, the breakdown. 
And finally, high caloric, high protein, in addition of patients who have a, a coexisting pressure injury um, and it cannot be achieved with a normal diet. So those are the three highly basically recommended changes in clinical practice on the consensus 2019 that we had spoken about earlier in terms of practice. Okay. This is, I, I, I just wanted, I'm not, this is nothing, no way of you even looking at it in this perspective. But this is sort of what is being recommended in terms of algorithms. So we spoke about care bundles and care bundles and what they lead to. So from risk, identifying risk, and then setting up your care bundle accordingly. This is an alternative where we can look at algorithms. So making an algorithm within your care area. So just as an example, this is a care algorithm. It looks complicated, but at the end of the day, what it does is it breaks it down in this side profile of what is the risk and how is that related to the care that you need to provide. So what we're trying to do is to take these risk assessment tools, so RATS as they like to call them, and try to implement a care map. And this is what's really important, is individualizing the risk in relationship to the treatment that needs to be provided to that patient. Okay. So, at the end of today, I know I've tried to basically take a lot of information and put it into a very short period of time, but we need to constantly improve and facilitate improvement of your knowledge all the time. We need to design care, care bundles and if, no, if not a care bundle, if not a algorithm related to the area that you work. So almost being clinically specific. Regular updates and don't miss out on the patient and their care providers with these updates. So you, you need to, as in educators in the room, as, as managers in the room, as as staff in this room, you need to make sure that your information is up to date, but then update the care providers that provide the care to those patients outside of the hospital and in the community. That is where you get more of a consistency, is making sure everybody is on the same page. I want to thank you. Okay, bums again. <laughs> so. So Catherine, we can go till quarter past. Uh, let's do a Q&A session and we'll wrap up. Is there anybody that has a question? We can, we can look at a few questions before you can go for a tea break. Okay, do you have a So there mic? is a microphone on every table. You can, uh, is, it's a green button. You can press it and hold the mic in front of you. So if you want to, if, if you do want to ask a question, that mic on in that little console flips up and then VJ says you push the green button if anybody would like to ask a question or just hear themselves on the mic. <laughs> Hello. Where am I looking? Over here. Over here. Yes. My name is Kathy. I would like to know if a person needs to get in contact with you, is there a specific website? Yeah. So I don't have a website, um, but you can email me if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my email address is Kath, C A T H, Dion, D I O N, Steer, S T W -E, e R, at gmail.com. I don't, I don't use my, my clinic specifically. I'd rather it be outside of that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, either I did a great job or I, I confused everybody <laughs> to bits. 
I so will be around if you have any specific questions that you'd like to come ask me and that we can discuss. Um, so Catherine, we do have uh, the acute care facilities here. We also have EMS. Maybe this will be interesting to hear what does emergency services uh, comments of how did this impact you? Um, it's a very white space for the Arjo community. I would be very interested to hear uh, emergency services if you've got a question regarding pressure injuries and I think Catherine did address that within one in four hours of a prayer, uh, it could happen. Um, so sometimes getting on an, into an ambulance and getting to the facility, you could have that break of a pressure injury already commencing. Anybody from emergency services that wants to make a comment? No? Uh, thanks. Uh, it's, my name is Colin Irakia from the Gauteng Emergency Medical Services. I think for us it's more with the long-term transfers that we do distance-wise that your pressure injuries, it may or may not impact on the patient's condition depending a P1. So I'll, I'm not sure, my question is what did you do in a situation where it's a, a P1 patient that you transport, especially somebody that's uh, intubated and under sedation? Uh, how would you, I mean our main priority will be obviously the airway breathing. Life, life, <laughs> yeah, life, life first. But the yes. pressure injury injuries may be secondary. So how do you manage that? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So um, yes, you're, you're quite right. I mean, life and limb will always come first. Um, we can worry about the risk later on. Um, I think in terms of being aware, if you can stabilize the patient, that's not the time to worry about any sort of risk um, to pressure injury. But once they're stabilized and you have a length of time um, with that patient and they're stable, then ba basically that's when you can implement some sort of offloading. So um, depending on what you have available, there is cushions and a few other things like for the occiput, for um, you know when they're intubated and everything else for the occiput um, on their head and always watching the heels, making sure the heels are not, not um, sitting directly on the stretcher, that maybe they can be elevated slightly um, in and around the cough area. Um, sacrum will be very difficult um, in, that, in that scenario, but after in the four to six hour mark, is when if the patient's stable and you're not worried about losing life or limb, that is the time, and you're still in transport, that's the time you need to start looking at what could I decrease the risk of? Okay, heels, ox to put at the time, and possibly even a shift to the sacrum, but I think unfortunately that's gonna be more difficult. So being aware of the length of time that you're in transport, and if the patient is stable after four to six hours and you're still in transport, then you can start worrying about offloading. Okay, um, I think refreshments are just outside where you had them previously, or do you want to do a little bit? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. So I, I did say we do have titans uh, that will be addressing us today, and I think she needs a louder applause. That was a phenomenal. <laughs> Catherine is an encyclopedia of knowledge, so thank you. Um, so just some announcements that I do have. Um, you would have seen the video at the beginning. Did you find a lot of products on that video that you were not familiar with or you have seen for the first time? Yeah? So um, we do have, it is a CPD event, so we could not bring in equipment nearby. We do have an audio face, so when you do navigate yourselves out, uh, on the right-hand side, there is an audio face. You can spend as much time as possible. All those equipment that you saw in the video are there, and we could even do live demos for you. Yeah? Uh, there's evaluation forms on your desks. If you could please complete it, I'll invite you to, when you've completed it, at the entrance there are bottles and there's a table there. If you could place it there, our Arjo crew are on standby to assist to collect them. Um, 
There is a HPCSA, a Health Professional Council, a register as well that you would have come in contact with. If you could please complete it. Um, we'll also be uh, sending this uh, to uh, the Health Professional Council so you do get your CPT points. It is a four point uh, for the session. Uh, another one is um, we do have a South African Nursing Council in our midst. Um, you did complete, everyone completed the register? Yeah? If you didn't manage to because you had arrived late, it's not a problem. Please do complete it when you're exiting. Uh, we will be giving you certificates of attendance, which you could submit. Uh, it will be given post-event. Uh, you could submit it uh, to, um, as your portfolio of evidence to SANC. Yeah? So you will be getting, uh, because there's no CPD points yet for SANC, your certificate would help you. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, I know I'll get a lot of smiles for that. Um, and so, yeah, is there any other questions, anything? You're welcome to contact our Arju crew. There are business cards, and um, we will send it within the next week. Uh, you will receive your certificates of attendance. Thank you very much, and it was awesome having you. And please do help yourselves at the back. There are some refreshments and the Arjo uh, Fair. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just want to introduce, uh, before we forget, remember that uh, there is going to be a VTE session. So it's now quarter past, we'll say 10 past 11. Let's come back at probably just at 28 minutes past uh, 11, and then we'll continue with Phoebe Bauer. She's going to be talking about the medical legal of uh, challenges and aspects for you. So let's be back by 20 minutes uh, past, 28 minutes past 11. So this is only a convenience break, it's not the end of the session. <laughs>